So, Namaste Anantuji, welcome, welcome to Ahimsa Conversations. Long overdue, I think after much planning, finally here I'm we so are. I'm so happy that you are here. <laughs> so, uh, to our viewers, we are at uh, the uh, Radha Swami Satsang Bias Dera, where Anantuji has been living as a member of the community for many years. And uh, it was a conscious decision that we didn't want to record this on Zoom. And uh, so, though we have been uh, talking about recording this Ahimsa conversation for, I think, more than a year and a half, it has finally happened today in September 2022. So, Anatoji, let's start with the same issue that we ask all our, uh, you know, speakers, friends, guests. What would be your earliest recollection of Ahimsa, either as a concept or an experience or an ideal in any form? I think I would trace it back to when I was in class four or five and it was not an experience of ahimsa as much as an experience of the difficulty of ahimsa. One second. I was sharing a small space with my elder brother. The setting was what's now called Kolkata. And the building was what you Bombayites would call it, chawl, full of ants, cockroaches, insects and so on. And we had been given that space to study. And we were both serious students. So I remember I was all concentrated on my books when a flying insect came and bit me badly. I screamed in pain and the insect went and lodged itself on the door in front of me. I was mighty angry with it and took a wooden club that was nearby and went to hit it. As I was about to complete my action, I hesitated because I said, oh, am I doing the right thing? But I had already taken the decision, so I went and hit it. And that didn't kill the insect. It was maimed and fell down and was struggling away. As I watched it, deep down, I was feeling so much for it. So I sat next to it and tried to help it and I was weeping. Literally, you know, tears were flowing from my eyes and I remember my brother looked at me and said, why are you weeping? You are the one who hit it, right? And it struck me that it's easy to talk about Ahimsa, very easy, but it's one of the most difficult things to practice. But that does not mean that we should not use it as an ideal. Mm. It's like a mountain climber, you know who, if he keeps looking at the peak, he will never reach the peak. He will only be disappointed. He will say, what am I going to do? But if he instead focuses on his next step, say, okay, that's my goal. I have to take the next step. What do I do? And in the case of someone who is seeking Ahimsa, that means listen to your conscience when you are taking the next step. If we can do that, that's all that we can do to reach that goal. We cannot reach that goal while we are in caught in what's called mind and maya. We have to go beyond that, the power Brahma stage, before we can really practice that. But we can still take steps towards that inner condition by which we can practice that. So, before we go into the details of this, Anantuji, because this is really the crux of what I want to learn from you, let's briefly cover your uh, journey.
from being an engineer, you were working in the US first for Xerox, then for IBM. And you gave that up and you came back to India to work in the Gandhian movement. Uh, uh, you worked at Gandhi Peace Foundation for many years, you were its secretary. And I just wanted to understand what was that process of uh, thinking and maybe unrest. Maybe there was some moral intellectual unrest that led you to give up what was the beaten track, well-known track, uh, and, and instead come back to do this work in, uh, in India and on the ground. Okay. Uh, if I were to summarize it. Sorry, start again from if I were to. If I were to summarize it, I would put it this way. All of us come into this world, we often say we come with nothing and we go away with nothing. But that's not quite true. We all come with a certain mindset and we go away with another mindset. Nothing else that we take. So it's really the kind of change that we bring about in our own mindset that happens to us. Now, I think we are given full freedom to opt for ahimsa or not to opt for ahimsa. And all my life has been exercising that option. In my younger days, I was what would be called an activist. School, college, I fought elections, was secretary of the Chhatra Parishad, the Students' Union, the Institute, Jim Khana, and, and so And college on. was IIT? College was two to three months at Loyola College in Madras before the IIT results were announced when I joined the Madras IIT. Right. And, and this was the what first batch within uh, uh, the campus at Madras IIT. Wow. And I studied, it was the second batch of Madras IIT, but the first batch within the campus. And I studied electrical engineering. Okay. That was my subject. Okay. And it was a five year course in those days. So, all through that period, I was very much involved in what would be broadly called activism. I remember my Bengali teacher giving an essay on, and the topic assigned was, your aim in life. And I said, in whatever little Bengali I could write, that such a terrible world, if I had been given a choice, I would not have come here. But having come, I want to do whatever I can to try and improve it, change it. That was my whole view at that time. And I remember the Bengali teacher returned that essay with same, very poor Bengali, but very good ideas. So, that's how my younger first 25, 30, 35 years went. I did go to the US and I was active in, apart from the India associations, the India-Pakistan Peace Corps and a movement called Freer India Movement. Mm -hmm. And during that time, I did wonder how come I had made many Pakistani friends then, mm -hmm. their interpretation of history or their understanding of India's history was quite different from mine. Mm -hmm. And I wondered, how does one figure out which history is correct? What actually happened? Which one is correct? Mm -hmm. Their idea or my idea? Mm -hmm. What I had learned or what they had learned? They being so, Pakistanis. They, Pakistanis. So how does one ever figure out what is the correct thing? And I realized later on that here Gandhi had a different concept of what exactly history is. And when JP came to the US and what he did and so on, attracted me so much and also my own disillusionment with what was happening in the US itself, that there was too much of self-centeredness, very difficult to make good friends. And in those days, Vegetarianism was unheard of, 
60s. I am talking about the 60s. No? I was there from 1965 to 69 mm. when I decided to give up my green card, in fact, surrender my passport and come back to India. That is, I had an Indian passport, but I decided not to renew it at all. I said, now I will live in India and I will try to do what I can to change society over here. And I was very much in the JP movement. And in one sense, the movement succeeded. But in another sense, I was very disappointed because I, you might have read Animal Farm. Yes. So I saw that enacted in front of me. And I said, there is something wrong. At the same time, I was also having, going through a lot of personal agony because one of my closest friends had had very bitter fight with him. And we were both involved in social change. And I was wondering, why is that the case? That's when I met Jyoti, whom I married. She was in Bombay teaching at St. Xavier's. And she too was going through a similar phase in her life. When she had joined the Bombay University teachers who were inspired by the Naxal movement in Kolkata. And her awakening point was when suddenly their main demand became increase the salary of the university teachers. And she said, well, that's not what we are supposed to do. But then the self is coming into the picture. And the small, the narrow self. The narrow self, okay. And that's the point at which I also read Edgar Snow interviewing Mao Tse mm -hmm. And Khrushchev had denounced the personality cult of Stalin. So Snow asked him, what do you think of personality cult? And Mao did not answer him directly, but counter question. He said, would you be happy? if nobody read your books. And I thought, that made me sit up. I said, there is something very deep here. And then they discussed why Mao and Liu Shaoqi split apart. And Mao made a statement that he behaved as though I were dead. Dead? Dead. He behaved as though I were dead. Uh -huh. I said, there is something very deep in it because that's what Gandhi says that look, unless you are ready to die, you cannot practice non violence. Unless you are ready to, to die, die, you cannot practice non violence. Mm -hmm. That means you have to detach yourself from the body and the mind from the narrow self. No, but I didn't follow how this is this insight is connected to what Mao said. Because he and Liu Shaoqi were together as great comrades and friends through the long march. Right. And yet, that narrow self came into the picture that, look, my ideas, my leadership is more important. And his presence, because when he talks about dead, he uses the word dead here, what he actually means is that the other fellow made him feel neglected. Yes, so exactly. that is the crux. That's where the ego comes yeah. into the picture. Yeah. But it's you know in 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 the Sikh tradition they use the word how may for it, may who, mm -hmm. I exist, me exists, mm -hmm. and that is the thing that we need to get away from if we want to really practice non-violence or ahimsa. Mm -hmm. And when Jyoti and I both read all this and tried to think about it, Jyoti said, "Look, let's leave our careers." and dedicate ourselves to some research to do it. And that's how we joined the Gandhi Peace Foundation. Okay. And so this was what? Gandhi Peace Foundation you joined in 77. 77. My gosh. Just as Kudal Commission was Absolutely. about to Absolutely. Uh, Kudal Commission came in 79. Uh, okay. After Indira Gandhi came back, back to power. To power. So, 77 was when she was removed from power. Right. When everyone was celebrating the victory of the JP movement. We decided to do something of the opposite.
Okay, and which was what? Which was to go into why it failed. Because to me, it was obvious that it had failed. Oh, the original ideals had failed. Yeah, yeah. You're saying the JP movement was a failure. Explain yes. that, Anantu. I mean, that's quite Some startling. Some kranti. What do we mean by that? Hmm. Total revolution. We're starting it. Some Some Sampurna kranti. We say total revolution. So, what does it mean? We often use such words. Hmm. But, do we really know what it means? Hmm. Revolution means completely changing it, the perspective. But ultimately, what happened was that the same factors that the JP movement was opposing, corruption, misuse of power, giving importance to the chair rather than to doing social service, became the way of functioning of those who have now come into power. Yeah. So, in therefore, in what way was the JP movement really a success? But Anantu, the slogan, Amla chahe jaisa hoga, haath hamara nahi uthega, that's not a small achievement because I think, uh, and as many conversations in this series have demonstrated, uh, many activists lived that faith. It was not only a I, I agree with slogan. You. So, if you can just I agree with in you. that you context. know, you have yourself named people like Vijay Pratap, yes. Anupam Mishra, yes. so many of them, Subbaraoji, they were of a kind who really practiced that. Yeah. But they are not the ones who got into power. It is true that JP movement had people who really attracted me because I, that's why I got into the movement. Because they were ones who were able to practice or do take the steps towards Ahimsa. Mm -hmm. People like Vijay Pratap, Anupam Mishra, in fact the younger generation people, also the middle generation people like Subarao, yeah. they were able to do that. But the important thing to recognize is that the JP movement did not put them into power. Those who came into power were of a different kind altogether. And I think that is the reason why it collapsed within two years and Indira Gandhi came back to power in a much stronger way yeah. than what she had done in the earlier years. Yeah. 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 But so out of this whole confusion, how did you remain focused on non-violence? I mean, what form then did your quest for non-violence take in this context? Well, in those 14 years that I was associated with the Gandhi Peace Foundation, it was more investigation. The, some of the prominent Gandhians used to, who were very much activists, going from place to place, doing things, organizing things, they, I think deridingly, used to refer to me as mere philosopher. But I felt that that was needed to go into. Because there was something fundamental that Gandhi had said, which probably even someone like JP had not really grasped. And that had to do with the whole inner journey and getting rid of the home of inner ego. You have to be a little beware that your voice doesn't fail. Okay. All right. So, from okay. Inner All right. So, you were saying JP didn't quite get the, the crux of that. So, the role, the role that the ego plays, the homey plays in our lives, and the importance of that role in understanding himself. Mm -hmm. That is what we were trying to focus on. Right. And essentially it means this, that not a single step should ever be taken in which we do not listen to our conscience. Huh. But Every that, single step. Yeah, that assumes that everybody has the same level of conscience. No. Conscience itself 
is never at the same level. In the sense that, see, conscience is there. Okay. Uh, someone. You deform me. Uh, yes, but as someone put it beautifully, conscience is like a dog that has been chained. When we pass by it, it barks. We can ignore its barking or we can listen to its barking. That choice is ours. If we listen to its barking, then we are taking the next step. And gradually, see that's the difference between morality and spirituality, which is I think the essential thing that most people are not able to understand. As we listen to our conscience, morality gradually flowers into spirituality, where it gets replaced by an inner voice, conscience. So people like Gandhi had what could be called an inner voice, in which you know you had the which disown. He famously, he famously called it the still small voice within. It. That's right. That's right. you know disown, which you focused on in one of your yes, very beautiful expression. I think of you know the Jharkhandis talk of and all the traditions they talk of how you you evolve from the part to the whole. Oh, that's what the word disown means. That is what the disown means. From the ordinary person to Purnam. Yes. Purnamada, Purnamidam. So each one of us is actually Purnam. But we can understand that, we can realize that only when we take these small steps, first listening to the conscience, then listening to the inner voice once that flowers within. And that is what I think was the essence of what Gandhi was trying to say and do. Hind Swaraj, Swa plus Raj, uh, the ability to rule yourself so that we never ever set the conscience aside and then we never ever set the inner voice aside. So I'm so glad that you mentioned Hind Swaraj Anandaji because I was waiting for a chance to uh, hear in this context, acknowledge and again thank you because your booklet of uh, where you shared your reflections on Hind Swaraj was a key turning point in my life. It was one of the uh, materials, one of the inspirations uh, in the backdrop of what finally led me on to the journey that became Baku Kuti. So one is I want to again acknowledge and thank you for that wonderful and very, very crucial contribution you made to my life. And, uh, and also ask you to hear, in a sense, just summarize why that text became so important to you and how you... Uh, were able to demonstrate its living presence and its living both inspiration and challenge in our world today. And the today in a sense is continuous even though you wrote it in the early 90s. I wrote it in the early 80s actually. One second. Hmm? No, sorry. Uh, okay. But no, from the booklet. Yeah. Uh, I wrote it in the 80s actually. Uh. And I it was the culmination of something that started in my childhood. When I was first introduced to Gandhi, my heart was completely with Gandhi, but my head was not. Okay. okay? Because I had been taught to question, I had been taught to understand this world in terms of what my science told me. For example, evolution, how it takes place. And there seemed to be a conflict there. My deeper understanding of Hind Swaraj led me to a resolution of that conflict, where the head fell in place with the heart. Mm -hmm. and, and that involved yeah. a deeper understanding of science and a feeling of what is happening, the larger picture about how humanity is evolving over the last 300 years and where it is going to go. And can you, in, in, a, in a nutshell, communicate? Let's assume that many of the friends and viewers who will see this uh, are not familiar with Hind Swaraj or Gandhi's argument. So this point about the last 300 years, okay. if you can just summarize that. Okay. See, 
about 300 to 500 years back, the direction in which humanity was going made a shift. Until that point, the priests had a great hold over how we were thinking. Even education was done through the seminaries and so on. And like what happens when any institution becomes powerful, they exercised their power to prosecute, persecute those who disagree. For example, that the earth is stationary and the sun is moving around the earth. So, in that sense, modern science was a great development because it helped us to think for ourselves. But, in a sense, in that process, the baby got thrown out with the bathwater because the whole question of what is life got ignored and life was seen as not a question of changing mindset within this from birth to death, but as a question of accumulating more and more. Why that happened was, you see, why has science and technology done such great wonders? It's because of mathematics. A mathematical model somewhere inside our own brain creates the entire universe within our brain. And there is a one-to-one -one accuracy there. For example, the planet Neptune was not known at all. Never, no one ever thought it existed until a mathematical model pointed to it. That's the greatness of mathematics. But the interesting and important point is that, which even scientists and mathematicians usually ignore, is that mathematics is pointing to what spirituality also points to. The unity between what seems diversity, the numbers that we use in arithmetic are all emanating from infinity, all are points from a line. Algebra, al sabra that's the origin, Arabic origin of the word algebra, which means putting together broken parts. So, mathematics is a way of, say, for example, mass and energy. They are regarded as completely different, but Einstein showed that they were linked. So, that's the greatness of mathematics. But you want to mention Ramanujam here at all? Yes. Ramanujam was very clear that an equation makes no sense to me until it tells me a thought of God. Because for him, his entire mathematics came from his focusing on the goddess Namagiri. So, that is the origin not only of Ramanujan's mathematics, but also of quantum mechanics, Schrodinger, who spoke very beautifully of the word consciousness, it has no plural. There is no such word as consciousnesses. So at the level of life, which is central to our functioning, we are all one. At the level of the body, we are different from each other. We cannot be one. At the level of the mind also, we cannot be one. But as Tagore said, the challenge is that how to unite despite the differences at the level of the mind. And that happens at the level of life. Yeah. And that is what quantum mechanics is pointing to. Yeah. And that is why Einstein was so disappointed with the current interpretation of quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. okay? And that's what we try to get into, Jyoti and I.
Yes. So this is fascinating. I mean, this is really fascinating. Uh, and with this uh, grounding that you've just given us, can you now again go back to how Hinswaraj in particular uh, uh, fitted into this exploration of yours? I mean, you know, how it in a sense, I think, took your exploration to some kind of almost, uh, is it fair to say, fruition? Hinswaraj basically is a questioning of modern civilization. There is a very beautiful quote of Gandhi when he is asked about at that time what was called Western civilization, what do you think of it? And his answer was, I think it would be a good idea. Because civilization means being civilized. And being civilized means being nice, kind to the other person. And that is not what is being encouraged. And that is because in our entire process of modernization, we have lost sight of the importance of morality and spirituality. Keynes put it very nicely. He said in 1930, that for at least another 100 years, we have to pretend to ourselves and to each other that foul is fair and fair is foul because foul is useful and fair is not. Greed, avarice and usury have to be our gods for a little longer still because it is only these gods that can take us out of the necessity of economic darkness into daylight. And here is where Gandhi disagreed. He said we will go further and further into darkness. That was the essential message of Hind Swaraj. So if we abandon morality and spirituality in the name of progress, development, we are dooming ourselves, which is what we are seeing in today's world. So with this background, Anantaji, you and Jyoti both moved to what was pretty much a, not a wasteland, but it was a denuded uh, uh, one-time forest area outside Bangalore uh, in Tamil Nadu. And you and your colleagues named it Namdarshanam. Um, in what ways did that experience and that endeavor of, in a sense, reviving a, a large area, uh, how did that connect with your, this philosophical and moral search for nonviolence? See, as I said, if anyone is to pursue nonviolence, it has to be one step at a time. Listening to conscience is the most important. And Navadashram itself was not planned by us. It was a natural consequence of listening to conscience. In 1988, I was asked to handle the administration part of Gandhi Peace Foundation. And I discovered certain things that made me very uncomfortable. And the conscience came into the picture. I tried to reason it out with those who had originally called me philosophers and they were a bit shocked at my knowledge of finance and accounting. And they said, no, we are not going to change this. That's not your job. I said, I can't be a party to it. And now that I'm in the administration, I was never secretary of Gandhi Peace Foundation. I was joint secretary, but at that time in charge of administration. So I said, now what do we do? And Jyoti was very clear. Look, your job is not to change things. Your job, in case you are not able to change it, through your persuasion, is to bring it to the notice of the board of governors. So I wrote a long report, presented it to them. 
and to my sadness, very great stalwarts who have dedicated their lives to doing great things, and yet they took the stand that, look, we are fighting for a larger cause, rectifying the wrongs in the government, and you can't, we can't focus on these smaller things. And to me, and Jyoti, that was unacceptable. That if we do things within the Gambian movement, which are not absolutely correct from the moral and ethical angle, any effort that we make to change things in the larger, at the larger government level is not going to succeed because the means and ends question is very central to Gandhian thought. And they said, now what do we do? We didn't know. And out of the blue came Om Bagadiya's proposal that, look, there is a place there in Tamil Nadu, not far from Bangalore, let's do something. And that's how Nava Darshanam came about. Could you just say that in English, what Navadarshnam? Yeah, Navadarshnam means new vision. But Darshan also has a different, has a deeper meaning, where we are seeing God. So the idea is to see God in everything. And that is possible only when the home or ego vanishes from oneself. So, not just other human beings, but animals, insects, birds, trees, everything, the whole idea is to see it all as one. So, go, getting away from plurality into oneness. That was the basic idea of Navadash. To implement it, of course, we had to do some things outwardly. We shifted from very urban setting, that is Delhi, to a completely isolated area mm -hmm. between a small hamlet and a reserve forest. Yeah, it was a wilderness. It was a wilderness. It was a wilderness. Yeah, complete but, with snakes and scorpions. Yes, absolutely. And that was one of the problems we had to deal with, how to live like that, yeah. how to live in a mud house and thatched roof and how to live without any electricity from outside, how to generate water for ourselves. So it was a very challenging thing and we were not used to it. We had lots of problems and difficulties but and there again I think that when we stuck to that original goal that look we will just take the next step. There is a higher power that also made sure that it worked. Yes. I don't think Jyoti and I can have any right to take any credit for what actually happened. It just worked out. Yeah. Yeah. And then when Jyoti left this world and I realized I can't run that place on my own, again that higher power came into the picture. It worked out that a younger generation set of people came. Again, it wasn't a very smooth process but it happened. Yeah. And then I realized I could shift to Vyas where I could focus on that original thing that had brought me to Navadarshanam, which was the science spirituality or now I would call it the mathematics and music connection. Maths and music? You will have to explain this, Arandu. And I mean, in particular, how you are able to do it at the Radha Swami Satsang Vyas. Uh, which we all from the outside, we know it to be a devotional uh, community uh, in the tradition of Guru Nana. So I'm really keen to know how, what in that context uh, enables you and inspires you to work on the connection between maths and music and how that is moving you are, uh, or how that is further refining your understanding of the doability of non-violence. Okay. Let me see how in simple ways I can explain this. First and foremost. Sorry, sorry. So from first. Yeah. So let me see a simple way that I can explain this. First and foremost. What is being taught here? Yes, Nanak is there, but there is a universal 
ultimately what is being taught here is the truth and not of some other world where we will go to after life the term used in the guru granth sahib is such khand the true section of this very world when i see you as different from me i am in jhoot khand say that again please when i see you as different from me i am in jhoot khand lies the, the false Under. section of this world or i am not false? seeing reality ah. because i am seeing only your body or your mind ah. at the level of the body we will be different at the level of the mind also we will be different we might be so close to each other even jyoti and i who were so close we had our difference at the level of the mind but at the level of consciousness which is our reality call it life force call it what you want at that level we are all one so that is such kind and that is what nanak talked of and that is what all the spiritual enlightened people all over the world have talked of whether it is kabir whether it is ramana maharishi whether it is ramakrishna paramhans whether it is jalaluddin rumi ramana uh, ramana maharishi ramana maharishi uh, christ all of them have talked of exactly that same thing so that is what is being promoted here in vyas and the time has come to speak of all this using logic and science rather than just devotion devotion is a very important thing but when we speak of devotion we are actually talking of the emotions getting attached to a god or a guru mm-hmm. but emotion by itself if it is not channelized will not become true devotion and to channelize it we have to be very clear about what we are trying to do mm-hmm. and that for that the intellect plays a very big role so that's where the head and the heart come together and therefore what i'm trying to do here is to explain the same thing that has been explained here using logic and science to come to the mathematics part see arithmetic and algebra have always pointed to the unity in the diversity the problem has been with geometry you see and here is where i see you know we know about talked of the era of religion and politics is over mm-hmm. the era of science and spirituality has begun when we look at the world we say, hey he was obviously wrong so much of religion and politics getting together in the worst possible ways but then when someone like vinova says these things it is not with 10 20 30 50 years in mind he is talking of a real long for them that's nothing at the level of the brahma one day is supposed to be 43 crore and something years so at that level for the spiritual people 50 100 years is nothing at all so he is talking of a long term change and the way i look at it what happened 300 500 years back the advent of modern science is a good thing in the sense that it made us abandon our unquestioning acceptance of what the priests were telling us or what of handed down practices handed down practices so that's a good thing but then now comes the next step the good thing happened because of the mathematical models which are all based upon arithmetic algebra and geometry and geometry is confined to what is called euclidean geometry mm. which has forms mm. so lines circles spheres one dimension two dimension three dimension mm. but in nature there is not even one thing that can be reduced to single two or three dimensions a leaf a cloud a mountain they are all in what is called fractals 
fractional dimensions. And here is where I think the new big developments are about to happen or in a sense already happening. How? The mathematics of fractals using the superpower of computers that we have developed today gives us mathematical models which would be very different from what we have had so far. Let me give you one example. COVID. COVID, uh -huh. Corona. Uh -huh. Now, it affects the lungs. The modern way of trying to figure out the body is to treat it like any machine, man-made machine, which all our man-made gadgets are based upon Euclidean geometry. Lines, circles, ellipses, spheres, nothing in nature is like that, including our body parts. The lungs has got a dimension of 2.97. 2.97. Now that's very difficult for us to understand what exactly is 2.97 dimensions. We can't. William Blake had used a word for what Gandhi talked of Swaraj, imagination. The ability to imagine something which is not form, which is formless. And that is where the connection between science, spirituality or mathematics, music, whatever you want to call it, with formless. Our body is a form. Even our mind is a form. But our real consciousness is formless. What Kabir had referred to as a nirgun. Gur, sagun upasana is we are worshipping a form. Nirgun upasana is when we go to the level of the formless. Hamid, I still didn't understand yes. how COVID uh, yes. alerted okay. you. So, COVID did not alert me. So I'm just giving that as an example. Yeah, how, how COVID serves as an example of yes. the movement okay. forward. So if you want to understand what COVID, today what's happening, there's a war on virus okay. to combat COVID, eh? injections, inoculations and so on. But that's a very reductionistic way of understanding reality, which has arisen because we have confined geometry to three dimensions which is to some extent natural because in our usual state of consciousness we can imagine only three dimensions. We cannot imagine anything beyond three dimensions. But if we keep listening to our conscience and reach that level where we can contact the inner voice within, then we go beyond. And that's what distinguished Gandhi from, say, Nehru. Mm. Nehru could not understand what Gandhi was trying to say in Hind Swaraj. It was very clear. He called it preposterous. That's the word he used. Because Nehru was schooled, like most of us are, in the modern way of education. Where our imagination does not go beyond three dimensions. Gandhi could. So, lungs, if we want to understand how human lungs are functioning, we need to do it at that level, where there is a unity. And then immediately follows the lesson of COVID. COVID is happening because we have invaded the realm of the viruses. They are now giving it back to us. The law of karma in practice. We thought, Descartes used that term, the aim of science and technology is to become master and possessor of nature. Nature is giving it back to us. And unless we learn that lesson, hopefully through a mathematical model which will give us a different picture of this reality, what exactly is the world, this world, such khand, this world that we are living in, a different picture of this reality, then we will be able to find a long-term solution for problems like covid like climate change? Well, we may not have the problems in the first place. We may not have the, but right now we have the problem. Yeah, so yeah. we first have to get but out I'm of the problem future. and then reach a state where we will not have these problems in the future. Uh, so in wrapping up, uh, Anantu, how would you uh, 
look at the material reality around us today because uh, yes as vinoba ji uh, prophesied or or projected uh, there are amazing possibilities in the long term and yet uh, as as mortal beings uh, we do tend to think in terms of the next 50 100 years uh, or even more we tend to think about the next week and the next one year absolutely so in that frame of time uh what are you feeling and can you in this i would like if possible for you to please address the young people today uh and i meet a lot of them who are truly seeking the paths of non violence or uh, by that i mean they they are inherently uh, kind uh, you know drawn towards compassion cooperation mutuality building of community and all of that in a sense adds up to non violence and yet they do sometimes feel very overwhelmed mm-hmm. 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 with the everyday whether it is on social media or it is in their material life mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, so can you share some advice and inspiration yes. of both what is your perspective say of the next 10 years and uh, how can those who wish to seek the realm of the such kind uh, live in the here and now so let's start with the here and now man what is the uh, yes go let's Let start me. with the here and now what is the most important thing that we need today right now every single human being needs at the physical level three things without which it is not possible to lead a comfortable life one is clean air second is drinkable water third is nutritious food and the tragedy of modern development is that it might have given us everything else but it has deprived of of these things when i went to the us in 1965 there was a mathematical student who also used to do parodies called tom lehrer he welcomed us with foreigners with a song which he sang in harry belafonte style in which he said when you visit american city you will find it very pretty just of two things you must beware don't drink the water and don't breathe the air in those days it was a real problem in the us today the us is much better that way than countries like india and china why because in those days the us used to manufacture anything and everything in the world made in usa was the thing. today it manufactures nothing it's outsourced to us and we are the ones who are facing the problem so there is something fundamentally wrong in what we call development and what is wrong is that our aim in life is to become a richer human being rather than to become a better human being if we can substitute it with becoming a better human being automatically we will have a social system by which these three fundamental necessities will be available to everyone how do we go in that direction i would say just stick to your conscience that's the next step to be taken to reach the peak if we start worrying about how it will be later on it's very difficult you know 50 years 100 years how let me give you one example 50 years back there was intense pressure on me to shift from a vegetarian to a meat diet and logic seem to say that look the doctors were saying protein deficiency very bad for health the economists were saying india has got such a terrible hunger problem and you are being stupid in allowing your cows to roam around there is food right there why don't you eat it the people who were moralized moralists were also saying 
know, vegetarianism is dying fat. Even the Brahmins are giving up. Why are you sticking to it? But somewhere in my conscience, I could not accept. And after a struggle, I tried, I vomited. And after a struggle, I said, no, I don't care what the world says or does. I'm going to stick to it. To vegetarianism. To vegetarianism. Now, what's happened in this last 50 years? I mean, something what is called a dying fad. Not just vegetarianism, I would say classical music, Indian classical music, especially Dhrupad. They have all come up in such a big way. So what is the force that made vegetarianism revive, that made Dhrupad revive? Today there are even black Americans going around with uh, this thing in their ear, listening to Dhrupad music, classical music. I mean, people like Kaushiki, Chakravarti are becoming so popular. How did that happen? There are certain other forces that run this world. We cannot run this world. Actually, that force that runs this world is within us. But we are not right now in contact with it because we are still struggling to listen to our conscience. Once we get to that level where we can be in touch with the inner voice, then we will be in touch with those forces. That's a different ball game altogether. Someone like Gandhi can do it. Ordinary people cannot. So that's okay. Ordinary people should listen to their conscience and move in the direction of reaching the peak. Mm, mm, mm. That's the step. One step at a time is enough for me. Mm. And that's what we have to do. And stick to it despite everything seems to point to the other mm. direction. Mm. Mm. In this, what advice would you give to young people or actually people of any age who often get stuck in the situation where you want to do something, but you know you ought to do something different. When the want and the ought to are at odds, uh, and then in some cases that gives rise to guilt, and guilt is never a conducive emotional mental state. So any any advice that By you could ought, give? you mean morally, ethically right? Yes. In that case, I would say just opt for ought. Just give up the world. Oh. That's the only way. Because we're only increasing our own long-term agony by opting for a want that is against the ought. So you have to be firm with yourself? Absolutely. Be 100%. And all that you're doing there is prioritizing your medium to long-term well-being That's right. over your immediate Absolutely gratification. Correct. Absolutely correct. But in moments where the want wins, is it violence against yourself to then, you know, wallow in guilt? You see, wallowing in guilt never helps. Life is there to learn from mistakes, to erase human. We are going to learn, we are going to make mistakes. Even the best of people, even Gandhi made such mistakes, but he tried to learn from it. And that is the difference between a person who is taking life seriously as far as the long-term goal is concerned, changing one's mindset of what one is born with. To, see, we have an option of changing the mindset. Okay? We can take it towards Ahimsa or away from Ahimsa. That's our option. But actually, we don't have an option. It's like if I am in school, Class, in a classroom. I have an option of studying or not studying, but actually I don't. If I don't study, I have to come back to the classroom. So you see, we have in theory an option of either listening to our conscience or not listening to our conscience. But it's a bit like when I'm in a class studying, say class 3, class 4, I have an option of studying or not studying. But if in a deeper sense, I don't have an option. If I don't study, I have to come back to that class. So it's like that. We come back to this world if we do not opt for Ahimsa. But if we do opt, it's a long-term process because it's not that we will succeed overnight. We will make mistakes. But as long as we learn from those mistakes, that's all that is we can do. 
and that's all that we should do. We should be happy with it. We should say that, okay, life has been well lived, irrespective of what the results have been. And that is, I think, the message of Gita also. Just do your duty and don't worry about the results. And therein lies the path of joy. There's, yeah. Once that attitude develops, then real joy comes in whatever we do. That is the thing. And I think the word Anand is far richer. It, it conveys a much, I think, wider universe of uh, experience than even the word joy. This is where I would connect it with what the Dishon concept is. Mm. The real Anand comes when we graduate from the part to the whole. Because then everyone and everything is included within us. And then the kind of joy that comes and the show school of leadership, right? So we need leaders who will have that attitude. And that is really, I think, the crux of the matter today. Today what we have are leaders who are the opposite. And it is not that leaders like Gandhi do not exist. Mm -hmm. We do not recognize them. We give no importance to them. If we change our mind and look for such leaders, rather than leaders who are very narrow-minded in the sense of the self or the ego coming into the picture, if we can do that, then society will take care of itself. So thank you so much. Aapka bahut bahut shukriya and uh, all the best. Thank you.